welcome spiritual family to a faithful God ministry. We are still shelter in place. So welcome to my home here again. It is truly an honor. I just want to take a moment to thank each and every single one of you, whether you're watching us online or you're listening to our podcast at at a Spiritual Tea Podcast. So I just want to tell you that it is an honor to be here with you today and presenting the good word to you today. Before I begin, a couple of key items. First and foremost, God loves you passionately and faithfully. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And a couple of key key announcements. So let's talk, let's talk shop for a quick minute. Let's talk shop. Our app, first and foremost, our app. Our app is available. It has a wealth of spiritual resources on there. Wealth of spiritual resources. And then if you want to connect with us, all you have to do is text the word FAITH to area code 218-400-4AFG. And last week I spoke about compassionate connections during this time compassionate connections during for uh, through prayer giving and and safety and if you need prayer or if you know someone in need of prayer please text us text the word pray to 218-400-4 AFG and if you would like to help others during this time if you would like to help others and families during this time text the word give now this is a different number but the number is all on our screen but text the word give to area code 833-559-80833 833-559-0833 and at the end of this message we have an important video about compassionate connections through safety during this time so be sure to tune into that one be sure to to watch towards the end for that one it's a very good video So, with that, let's take a moment to reflect on our past week and give God praise and worship because no matter how hard the test was, we made it. We made it here today. I read that test test turns into a testimony and the mess and your hot mess turns into a message. Amen. Yes. So, are you ready to receive some spiritual, spiritual nourishment today? It is my pleasure to bring the good news of hope, love, and encouragement and faith in God. See, it is written. It is written that the good news does not come to you only by word. It doesn't only come to you by word, but it comes to you with power and through the Holy Spirit. My goal is to bring the light of God into the darkest areas on your pathway. Because see, what we have to do, we have to turn on the light to get rid of the dark, correct? Now, I cannot change your current situation. I cannot do that. But what I can do is point you to the one who can. Amen? Amen. Now, the title of my message is, you ready for it? Watch where you sit. Watch where you sit. And I'm going to spill all the spiritual tea about where you should sit. Right? I'll be referring to 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 3 through 5 and Matthew chapter 28 1 through 2 let's start with the prayer dear Heavenly Father thank you for another day for your glory thank you for breathing life and light into each and every single one of us thank you for the blood of Jesus that gives me the privilege to come to you boldly dear Heavenly Father God, I realize realize there is no better plan in this world than yours. And I pray that your will be done in all areas of our lives that are empty and depleted. I pray your will will be done in this world. This world is lost and needs you desperately. And I pray for every person to know you and experience you as their personal savior. I pray that the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. I pray that the doubting find faith and that the sorrowful find comfort. I pray that the believer be encouraged and the lost find salvation. Forgive our sins and cleanse our hearts. And speak to you, speak to us through this word, dear Heavenly Father, today. All in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'll first be referring to 1 Kings chapter 19, 3 through 5. So while you look that up, while you look up that verse, I want to share a short, funny story with you. One Sunday morning, 
an elderly woman walked into our local church and a friendly usher greeted her at the door, happy, bubbly, and helped her up the, the flight of steps. And as they were walking into the sanctuary, he asked her, where would you like to sit, ma'am? And she answered, the front row, please. And he bent over and he whispered to her and he told her, you really don't want to do that. The pastor is really boring. And she turned to him shocked and she said, she asked him, do you happen to know who I am? And the usher responded, no. And she says, I'm the pastor's mother, like matter of factly. And he asked her, he asked her do you know who I am? And she said, no. And he said, good. I once spoke about our spiritual waiting room. Our spiritual waiting, waiting room is, is the starting area of our spiritual strengthening process. And the waiting room is where we go when we, when we like all caught up in our feelings some type of way. When we feel in some type of way, this is where we go. Like spiritually in our mind, we go to a spiritual waiting room. And our spiritual waiting room, what it is, it's, like a, it's almost like an exercise room for our mind, meaning this is where we strengthen our spiritual beings spiritually, right? This is where we strengthen ourselves, right? Our mind and spiritually. This room is where ultimately we need to spiritually mature. And during this time, this waiting time in our spiritual waiting room, this is where we need to be diligent, proactive, and value our time. So we need to watch where we sit in our spiritual waiting room. Where we sit in our spiritual waiting room matters. Our spiritual waiting room offers a full seat of emotions ranging from peace to extreme anxiety. So imagine, imagine with me for a second. Imagine with me for a second. We have this room, right? We have this room. This is our spiritual waiting room. And as we walk into this room, there are all these chairs, all these chairs known as the seat of emotions, right? All these chairs. There's a seat for despair. There's a seat for fear. There's a seat for pain. There's a seat for peace. There's a seat for faith right? All these chairs are there to choose from. So I got a question. I got a question. How many of you are strategic seat planners? Strategic seat planners. Like you put thought into where you are going to sit. Like when you go to baseball games or concerts and you look at the seating chart, you put actual thought, strategically place yourself by closer to the stage or closer to the exit so it's easier to leave. Like you strategically plan out where you're going to sit. Like for me example, for me example, when I used to commute into the city on the ferry, I would wake up a little bit early, a little bit early to make sure that I was at least in front of the boarding line, right? I wanted to be one of the top 10 people to get on the ferry, right? Because see, this was my theory. My theory was, I want to be able to pick my seat, not my seat pick me. Because if I pick my seat, then I can kind of control the people that's gonna come sit around me. But see, if the seat picks me, I can't control where I'm sitting, right? I can't sit by the window. That's where I always like to sit is by the window, right? So that was my theory, that I want to be able to pick my seat and the seat not pick me. Sometimes it matters where we sit. Sometimes we ma it matters where we sit. We want to choose the seat and not the seat choose us, right? So it matters where we sit. When our circumstances change, when our circumstances change, it matters where we sit. It matters where we sit. When the storm comes in, when it comes in, it matters where we sit, right? When the enemy waltzes in our mind, it matters where we sit, right? There were a lot of places in the Bible, a lot of references in the Bible that said someone sat down, someone sat under, someone was sitting. It's a lot of references in the Bible that reference someone sat down. For instance, for instance, Jesus sat down in a lot of different places, right? And God is seated on his throne, right? And if you were to cross-reference the different scriptures, you will realize every time it will refer to a place that someone sat inside the Bible and the scripture, it meant something. It meant something. It was symbolic, right? It meant something. 
let me let me show you an example. Let me show you an example. Let me show you an example. So in Kings, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3, basically it goes like this. Elijah had just experienced two great spiritual victories. Two great spiritual victories. Number one, the first victory was the defeat of the false prophets. And the second victory was the answer prayer for rain. Now, Elijah found himself on the run, deep into the wilderness, where he came to a boom, a broom bush, broom bush, and sat under it. And he prayed that he might die. So Elijah came to a broom bush. He came to a bush, a broom bush. Now, there's a couple of couple of interesting things about a broom bush. The first thing is that the broom bush, it grows in dry places and it produces a bitter root. And the twigs from the broom bush can be used for binding. So let me, let me, let me take all these interesting facts that I just shared with you and put them back into context, right? Basically, Elijah found himself on the run in, in the depths of fatigue and discouragement. See, because see, discouragement, I spoke about discouragement before, but discouragement typically comes into the room. It typically comes into our spiritual waiting room after spiritual experiences, right? And that's the enemy. So Elijah found himself on the run in the depths of fatigue and discouragement. So here, here he was facing all kinds of emotions, caught up with all kinds, just all up in his feelings and all fatigue and with all these hardships. He was depleted. He was worn out. He was D-O-N-E. He was done, right? And in the midst of despair, in the midst of all his despair and his discouragement, in the midst of it, he decided to sit under the boom, bro- the broom bush, the broom bush. Keep saying boom, but the broom bush. He, he he decided to sit under the broom bush. He decided to sit under his despair, right? But the verse goes on to tell how God nourished and cared for Elijah. See, we may be in a dry, we may be in a dry, deserted place in our lives with bitter circumstances just growing underneath us, right? Just underneath us, just bitter circumstances just growing underneath us. And we're in that dry, deserted place. But see, you got to understand, no place is impossible for God. No place is impossible for God. See, what he can do is he can reach down into the deepest, darkest depths and untangle all those bitter roots and bind you to his love. Are you still with me? Good. Let me give you another perspective. Let me give you another perspective about where you should sit, right? Let me give you another perspective. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 through 2, basically it goes like this. The Lord sent his angel to Jesus' tomb. And when the Marys went down to the tomb, I call them the Marys, right? But when the Marys went down to the tomb, there was a violent earthquake and the angel rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel sat on the stone. See, the angel didn't come down in some kind of grand, glorious manner with all kind of dramatics, right? He didn't come down and roll away the stone, do the milly wop, give himself a pat on the back like job well done, like I did that. I let Jesus out, right? I rolled away that stone all by myself, right? He didn't come and do that, right? No, the angel came down from heaven, rolled away the stone, and then he sat on it, sat on it. See, there's something symbolic something symbolic not only where he sat but what he sat on top of there was something symbolic not where he sat but what he sat on top of right the angel sat on the very thing that the enemy tried to use to stop Jesus and this is the same for us when we are in our spiritual waiting room God will come to save us, meaning not only will he roll the stone away, but he'll sit on top of it, right? Okay, okay, all right. I want to make sure that you guys are still following me about the importance of where we sit and how it's symbolic. So 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a somewhat relatable perspective, right? Example, right? And with this one, I got my handy dandy sketcher, my handy dandy hand that's going to sketch this out for me, this illustration out for me. It's, it's really from my software, but I named the little hand Abigail. So Abigail's going to sketch, sketch this for me while, we, while, while I tell this, tell this illustration so you can be clear and visualize. So, Rosa Parks, I read this. Rosa Parks was arrested in 1955 for refusing to give up her bus seat. And in her book, Quiet Strength, she wrote this. When I sat down on the bus that day, I had no idea history was being made. I was only thinking of getting home. But I had made up my mind after so many years of being a victim of mistreatment my people suffered, not giving up my seat and whatever I had to face afterwards was not important. I did not feel any fear sitting there. I felt the Lord give me the strength to endure whatever I had to face. It was time for someone to stand up or in my case, sit down. So I refused to move. See, after many years of mistreatment and suffering, Miss Parch chose her seat. She chose her seat suited up already. She was suited up in her spiritual armor, right? In her suit of armor. She had on her shield of faith. She believed and she knew that God was going to take care of her, right? See, when we walk into our spiritual waiting room with all of our seats of emotions, we need to make sure that we're suited up, that we're suited up heavily, right? That we're suited up with our suit of armor too. Because see, God will give us the strength to endure our hardships. He will give us the strength. He will give us the strength to endure the pain, the hurt. He will give us enough strength to say enough. Amen? Amen. So let's break this down. Let's, let's break this down. We have Elijah who sat underneath his circumstances, right? We have Elijah who sat underneath his circumstances. And, and then we have the angel. We have the angel who sat on top of his circumstances. And Miss Rose Park, Miss, Miss Parks sat on her circumstance, right? So do you know what the Greek word for sit, sit under it is? for sit under, sit under it. What is the Greek word for sit under it? What is that? It's exactly what it says, sit under it, right? Meaning it's not even relevant. It don't even have a relevant meaning, right? Sit under it doesn't even have a meaning. But the Greek word for on, like the angel sat on the stone, means above and beyond. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is when we are in the depths of our despair, in the driest, darkest areas. God will go above and beyond what we can imagine by not just rolling away the stone, but sitting on the very same circumstance that tried to break us, right? That tried to break us. God will go above and beyond what we can imagine, right? What we can imagine by not only rolling away the stone, but sitting on the very same circumstance that tried to break us, right? See, he is moving. This is what God is doing. He is moving the stone of despair, the stone of disappointment, the stone of fear, the stone of anxiety. And not only is he moving it, not only is he, is he going to just roll it away, we can watch him sit on it, right? So I'm going to share another illustration with you. Don't you guys just love my illustrations? I love my illustrations. So I'm going to share my illustration with you. And now, again, I got my handy dandy sketcher hand, Abigail, who's going to sketch this up for me as I tell the story. So one night, there was a man who was sleeping in his cabin when suddenly his room filled with light and the Savior appeared. The Lord told the man that he had work for him to do and showed him a large rock in front of his cabin. And the Lord explained that the man was to push against the rock with all his might. So the man did, day after day, from sun up to sundown, his shoulders set squarely against the cold, massive surface of the unmoving rock, pushing with all his might, day after day, 
from sunup to sundown. And each night, the man returned to his cabin sore and worn out, feeling that like his whole day had been spent in vain. And seeing that the man was showing signs of discouragement, Satan decided to enter the picture, placing thoughts into the man's mind, such as, you have been pushing against this rock for a long time and it hasn't budged. Why kill yourself over this? One day he decided to make, to make it a matter of prayer and take his troubled thoughts to the Lord. And so he told the Lord, Lord, I have labored long and hard in your service, putting all my strength to do what you have asked. Yet after all this time, I have not even moved that rock a half a millimeter. What is wrong? Why am I failing? To this, the Lord responded compassionately. And the Lord said, my child, when I asked you to serve me, you accepted. I told you that your task was to push against the rock with all your strength, which you have done. Never once did I mention to you that I expected you to move it. Your task was to push it. And now you come to me, your strength spent, thinking that you have failed. But is it that, is it really that? Look at yourself. Your, your arms are strong and muscled. Your hands are callous from constant pressure and your legs have become massive and hard. Through opposition, you have grown much and your abilities now surpass that which you used to have. Yet, you haven't moved the rock, but your calling was to be obedient and to push and to exercise your faith and trust in my wisdom. This you have done. I, my child, will now move the rock. See, when we are in our spiritual waiting room, the enemy will come. He will come to block us in by putting a stone in front of our door. And this is our test. This is our test to see what seat of emotions we will choose. What seat of emotions will we choose? right? Well, we choose the seat of fear, right? The seat of fear or discouragement. During this time right now, during this time of uncertainty, right? Currently, right now, are you seated in the, in, in, in the seat of fear or despair? Where are you sitting right now? Where are you sitting right now? Are you, or are you taking the seat of faith and you're just watching the stone by the door. And while you're watching the stone, you're being obedient with the open heart and the open mind and open eyes and allowing for God to strengthen you and whatever he has planned for you. Right. And you're waiting for him to not only just roll away the stone from in front of that door, but to sit on top of it. See, we can we can either sit under our circumstances or we can sit on top of them. We can't do both right? You can't do both. Now, I'm going to say that again. Either you can sit underneath your circumstances or you can sit on top of your circumstances, but you can't do both. You can't do both. When the angel rolled the stone and sat, sat on it, what that did is it told us, it told us that here and now, like currently here and now, what was meant to break us, what was meant to break you will become a seat of mercy, right? What was meant to destroy your being will become a seed of restoration and redemption. What was meant to hurt us will become a seed of healing. What was meant to make us fearful will become a seed of divine protection, right? What was meant to make us weak will become our seat of strength. What was meant to discourage us will, be, will become our seat of overflow blessings. What was meant to defeat us? What was meant to defeat us? will become our seat of victory. Amen? Amen. The stone. I'm here to tell you. I'm sharing the good news. That's what I'm here to do. I'm sharing the good news. And what did I tell you? My goal is to give you the light, God's light on the hardest, darkest pathway. And that's what I'm here to share you. So I'm telling you right now, understand the stone is being rolled away and the light is coming. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's lift. Let's pray. Let's lift our hands wherever you are. Let's lift our hands and receive the Lord Jesus Christ right now. 
and let's pray. Heavenly Father, you reach into the darkness with hope, truth, and light. Stretch out your strong hand. Hold and rescue those who are suffering. Roll away the stone. Provide us the seat of victory and glory. Hallelujah, yes. Let your almighty love move mountains, cross seas. Breathe life into the darkest places. Breathe your light into any dark areas. Light that redeems, light that restores, light that heals, light that protects, light that saves. There is nothing higher, stronger, or greater than your love. We trust in you. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, you've heard the good news. You've heard the good news today, and we hope that you felt his presence in your life today. And if so, please take the time to share the good news by sending this message to at least five people, five of your friends or your family, right? To at least five people, share the good news. And I also ask that you please join us at A Faithful God Ministry this week by reading Anxious for Nothing, the seven-day reading plan in the Bible app. We have a special link right here on our screen. And also, remember, be sure to tune in at the end of this message for a PSA about Compassionate Connections, PSA. That's a public service announcement for those of you that don't know that's slow to the train station. But PSA, after this after this message. With that, many blessings. What is a compassionate connection? Compassionate connection is praying for one another. A compassionate connection is doing our part. Bottom line, during a time like this, a compassionate connection saves lives. Do your part. This ad is sponsored by A Faithful God Ministry.